Yes. So there's just another four or five documents on the topic of supplies and mechanics and of supply and shortages um, to look at uh, um, b before looking at some documents relevant to the question of prophylaxis. DHSC 30s. 2197 underscore 084, please show me. This is a letter written by Dr. Aaron Stam, um, uh, dated the 18th of April 1980, to the British Medical Journal, and it's on the topic of supply. It says, Dear Sir, factor rate supply and demand. Both Biggs and Cash have estimated the requirements of factor rate in the UK to be around. 50 million units per annum. Both these authorities have based their calculations on the annual usage of factor eight up to and including 1975. For reasons documented below, I believe this figure to be now a very serious underestimate of future requirements. And, and then he gives his reasons. A, an explosive growth in prophylaxis, negligible in 1975 in the UK, has taken place from 1976. The use of prophylaxis has been shown to substantially increase the usage of factor eight, two to four times the amount of factor eight in current use being required for a prophylactic program. B, the number of patients on home therapy in the UK increased by one third in 1976. Ritzer has shown that patients on home therapy use 15% more factor eight than those on hospital-based treatment. This increase in material usage may be balanced out by the trend to lower dosages for early bleeds treated at home. However, the 15% failure rate at low dosage, which is, which is not very different from the retransfusion rates for boys at Lord Mayor Law College, cannot be ignored. Uh, uh, as the majority of bleeds occur into the knees, elbows and ankles, it's disturbing to contemplate the effect of lowering the dose of factor rate still further in the 15 to 20% of joint bleeds, which would have failed to respond even to standard dosage. Um, and then his, his point C refers to lengthening uh, lifespan, haemophilic lifespan likely to lead to a doubling of the haemophiliac population. Uh, point D, uh, self-evident that most haemophiliacs who were able to produce children in the past were likely to have been suffering from milder forms of the disease because the severity of the disease breeds true in families an improvement in survival and therefore of reproductive capacity is likely to bias the haemophiliac population to the severer forms. As the severest 20% of the haemophiliac population use 80% of the blood resources, this will have a considerable impact on demand of factor eight in the future. Point E relates to the treatment of patients with inhibitors. Um, and he refers to patients with low inhibitor levels and low antibody response to treatment with factor VIII are now treated with high doses of factor VIII for almost all bleeds. Um, so those are the reasons uh, that he identifies uh, for considering that the Biggs and Cash estimate is a very serious underestimate. And then he says this, it's apparent from my own experience that the National Health Service cannot provide more than a fraction of my needs for the treatment of 70 severe haemophiliacs. The shortfall is made up by the purchase of expensive commercial concentrates, and it has been made plain to me that there will be pressures to cut the amount made available, and in the foreseeable future, no prospect of any increase. If this situation is reflected nationwide, and I have no reason to believe that it is not, then the escalating requirement must shortly overtake the diminishing resources and create a major crisis in the expectations for haemophilia treatment. I think it is essential that we recognize an attempt to avert this approaching crisis, as it is apparent that the National Health Service facilities are incapable of processing enough of the voluntary donations from this country. Surely we should explore the possibility of commercially successful private industries fractionating the material for the National Health Service. This approach would provide a glimmer of hope in what is otherwise seems a very gloomy prospect. Um, and as, as well as writing in those terms to the British Medical Journal... Was it published? Ah, um, do you know, um, I, I think it was, or his expectation was that it was, but we have it in this form. Um, I'll, I'll have to check. Um, but if we look at DHSC 302197 underscore 083. We can see on the 30th of April that Dr. Aronstam wrote to uh, Patrick Jenkin, Minister for Health and Social Security, saying, I enclose a copy of a letter awaiting publication in the British Medical Journal. I think you may not be aware of the facts presented and possibly not of the commercial alternative 
to a therapeutic disaster. And that is presumably a reference to what he says at the end of the letter about the possibility of asking commercial private industry to fractionate NHS material. Um, Uh, um, there was certainly a letter published in the BMJ from Dr. Aronson in September 1980. I'll need to compare the text. It's on the, 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 the same theme, but whether it was identical in text, I'll need to check. We know that because Dr. Biggs, I'm sorry, Dr. Bidwell wrote to Dr. Aronson in response in, in October 1980, taking issue with some of what he'd said. Um, but I just want to pick up then on Dr. Aronson's own letter back to Dr. Bidwell, because our concern today is to learn more about the, the approach to laws and in particular the approach of Dr. Aronstam. That's at CBLA 301199. Um, it's a letter of the 10th of November 1980 in response to Dr. Bidwell's letter of the 29th of October. Um, uh, it, and, and you'll see she had used in her response um, uh, phrases such as ill-informed and half-truths. Um, but I just want to pick up what's said in the last paragraph. My main concern, says Dr. Aronstam, is the provision of sufficient factor eight for the adequate treatment of my patients. And I remain concerned that there is still no prospect in sight of the National Health Service being able to provide me with sufficient factor eight. I remain dependent on the purchase of expensive commercial concentrate, much against my will, uh, is what Dr. Aronstam there said. Um, and then we've looked previously, I won't go back to the document itself, at the, the UK HCDO meeting in September of 1980, at which there was a discussion about the, the, the switch to the pro rata system of returns in terms of what would be made available to the haemophilia centre would depend upon what the local blood transfusion centre was able to send to BPL. But there was a um, specific discussion that then followed about what would happen for the Wessex region because of Lord Mayor Chalor's, um, uh, um, what was said to be its special position. And if we can go to CBLA 301294. Um, this is a document we looked at in part during the presentation on the Belfast Team Affiliate Centre because the, it contained a discussion of the position in relation to Northern Ireland. Um, so it's a report for the Advisory Committee on the uh, National Blood Transfusion Service. Uh, and it's a report, um, Internal Department of Health Report, February 1981. Uh, we'll see the heading is pro rata distribution of blood products. And paragraph one says, as members know from the 1st of April 1981, it is intended to introduce a system of pro rata distribution of certain blood products to ensure that regional health authorities receive such products in proportion to the quantity and quality of plasma sent to BPL for fractionation. Um, so that was, that was the, the, the general scheme. But if we go to the second page, we can then see the specific discussion in relation to how that scheme might apply in Wessex. So if we zoom in at the top half of the page, thank you. Paragraph five, each RHA, each regional health authority, has at least one haemophilia centre. However, Wessex Regional Health Authority faces a special problem regarding its level of factor eight usage because of the Lord Mayor Chalor Hospital. The hospital might more accurately be described as a residential school and its pupils 40, all of whom are severe haemophiliacs, are drawn from all over the country. Any system of special allocations must be kept as simple as possible to avoid additional work for BPL. One possible method of calculating such an allocation for the Lord Mayor Chalor would be on the following lines. And then we can see what's set out. BPL produces 14 million units of factor rate per annum for use in approximately 1,800 severe haemophiliacs. Therefore, a special allocation could be made to the Wessex Regional Health Authority, in addition to that due under the pro rata distribution, of 7,500 units per pupil. This figure could be reviewed annually to take into account BPL's increase in production and changes in the number of pupils in the hospital. As Appendix 1 shows, under a strict application of pro rata, Wessex Regional Health Authority would lose approximately 288,000 units per annum. This system would restore 300,000 units to the region. Such an allocation could be accommodated within the 20% figure described above. The Secretariat acknowledges that this is very much a rough and ready assessment. However, a more sophisticated basis of calculation, e.g. one based on individual patients' needs, 
or a system which sought to take into account individual arrivals and departures could place an additional administrative burden upon BPL at a time when the pro rata system itself will, will inevitably add to the laboratory's workload. There could also be difficulties in defining patients' normal residence when this sometimes happens a patient's family moves to Wessex to be closer to the hospital. And then if we look at this third page, we can see um, towards the top of the page under the heading summary paragraph 10 that the committee's views were sought on and a number of questions, but the first of which was whether a special allocation should be made to Wessex because of the Lord Mayor Trelaw Hospital, and if so, how that might be assessed. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of the decision that was made, um, we can see it briefly referred to, we, we haven't got all the underlying documents available today, but if we just look at CBLA 301341, um, we can see in, in this letter from Dr. Lane to the DHSS dated the 24th of April 1981, it says, I believe it's now agreed that the only special provisions for factor rate distribution are as follows. And the first there is the Lord Mayor Chalor College. So the, the um, decision to have a, a special allocation um, was um, um, thus approved. Um, the, the final topic on the question, or as it were, under the heading of, of blood product uh, usage and, and, and approaches to treatment, is just to look a little bit more at the question of prophylaxis. So we have seen in the oral evidence that we've heard this week various references to prophylactic treatment. And, and what we've seen this week is, as far as we can ascertain, pretty representative in, in, in terms of the approach to prophylaxis generally for other Trelaws people. So we've looked at the records, thousands of pages of documents, um, ultimately in terms of individual medical records uh, of pupils at Trelaws. And we see prophylaxis, prophylactic treatment, as a regular feature of the treatment of the pupils at Trelaws. And so I'm not going to go back to, to then to, to any of the individual witness statements, but we've referred to a number of individual statements in our written note, in addition to those from whom we've heard orally, which discuss um, um, uh, the, the, the use of prophylactic treatment on an individual basis. Um, but there's just a handful of further documents which, um, that again, perhaps just throw a little further light on, on Trelaw's approach to prophylaxis. If we look at TREL 40332 underscore 068, So this is a letter from Dr. Aaron Stam, 14th of November 1978. It's to Professor Lee at St. Mary's Hospital, Portsmouth. Um, again, it, it's in the context of a specific patient, and this is not um, a current Trelaws patient. We can ascertain that from um, the, the date of birth that we see at the top, 1959, or, or probably not a current Trelaws patient. Um, but but the, again, there's, there's, a, there's a general... Um, insight into uh, uh, um, Dr. Aronstam's views on, on prophylaxis. Uh, so we can see at A, Dr. Aronstam says, I undertake the clinical responsibility for 55 of Britain's severest haemophiliacs for 36 weeks of the year. There's no way I'd be prepared to take on this commitment without the freedom to make my own clinical decisions. And then there's reference to a, a particular conversation um, held with Professor Lee's registrar. I don't think we need to go into that. Uh, he says, I, in the next paragraph, I should point out that my patients come from many sources and to be managed in many different ways, some good, some bad. I try to have a consistent approach to treatment here, which means that I occasionally use a different approach to that of the home center. As far as prophylaxis itself goes, I'm well aware of its potential for re reducing the frequency of bleeding episodes. Having published two controlled trials from the center, what I'm also becoming increasingly aware of is the potential danger to our haemophiliac population of hypertransfusion with blood products. Over the past year, only 12 of our 55 boys have had liver function tests which remained normal. Several authorities have recently reported increased incidences of chronic aggressive hepatitis. There is also accumulating evidence that the haemophiliac population has a higher blood pressure than the normal population. And our observations here suggest that this may also be related to frequency of transfusions. And then there's a reference again to the individual patient. 
I am therefore increasingly wary of the indiscriminate use of blood products in our boys. This does not mean that I do not use prophylaxis in certain situations. I believe that the clinical indications for prophylaxis are, and then we can see three indications given frequency of bleeding. By this I'm talking about 20 to 30 bleeds per 100 days. I'm sorry, can we take this document down? There's a name that's not been redacted. I'm just going to read um, the relevant parts of the remainder of this letter, if I may. Um, uh, um, so um, Dr. Aronson says, I believe the clinical indications for prophylaxis are one, frequency of bleeding, two, the covering of a bad patch, three, cover for an extended course of physiotherapy and for invasive procedures. And then he says, I do not believe in extended prophylaxis in any other situation. There's then a discussion about the treatment of the individual patient again. Um, and then at the bottom of the second page, just so, so for, for your notes, sir, when you look at the in document um, again, um, Dr. Aronson refers to available resources of factor eight, says this country is not sufficient in factor eight. And even if I believe that prophylaxis was always the right management for all haemophiliacs, we are still in the position of rationing this form of treatment. It is up to all of us to allocate resources responsibly and as we see fit. Um, and then uh, he, his uh, next point in the letter um, is headed the influence of different environments. And Dr. Aronson says this, the situation at Trelaw College currently is that treatment is immediately available and our boys are almost bullied into the early reporting of bleeds. Consequently, they lose minimal time from school um, compared to, and, and, and then he compares it to the situation of those having to be admitted um, 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 elsewhere. Um, and then uh, uh, he says, um, at the end of the letter, from our extensive experience of prophylaxis, I can assure you that unless combined with an active course of physiotherapy, prophylaxis does not improve either joint function or the underlying bleeding frequency. So we can see there, so in November 1978, um, Dr. Arenstam, as it were, expressing some qualifications or limitations of, um, um, on the use um, of uh, prophylaxis. Um, and then, again, just to try and get an insight into his overall approach to prophylaxis, if we look at TREL 40108 Again, this is um, a letter, this is 16th of January 1980, um, uh, and this, um, I think, is a letter to uh, a parent, but if we just pick it up in the second paragraph, third line, Dr. Aronstam says, Dr. Aronstam says, we only give prophylaxis in short courses here and only when a particular joint is being threatened. I am afraid we do not have the resources to give any of our 55 severe haemophiliac boys a long course of prophylaxis just because of bleeding frequency. You will realize that it all costs a lot of money and the National Health Service just doesn't have that sort of money at the moment. Please rest assured, however, that if any time I feel that your boys were into short course of prophylaxis, they will certainly get it. Now, the, the view expressed there in 1980, January 1980, compares with uh, his uh, indications for treatment just over a year earlier, uh, where, which appeared to indicate that the indication for prophylaxis was 20 to 30 bleeds in every 100 days, which would suggest long-term prophylaxis. So they don't fit, do they? No, and, and so the, uh, uh, the purpose of going to these documents is really to map out what appears to be um, a degree of inconsistency or, or at least tension in what is said by Dr. Aronstam at different times, both in terms of availability of supplies and in terms of the approach to prophylactic treatment. I mean, he, he's entitled to change his views. Absolutely. Um, but um, it's not obvious at, at what stage and, and on what basis. No, and, and we obviously can't ask him. And so um, the only way to try and ascertain what his approach might have been and what the significance that, of that might then have been in turn for what happened at Chalors is to look at what he says at various times to various different people. Um, I, I, w there is also a section on prophylaxis in his uh, thesis, but I'm going to come on to that uh, again when, when I look at research, which will be on, on, I think, Friday of this week. 
Um, um, and then, uh, um, a, a document that I think is, is probably consistent with the oral evidence we've heard, but if we just look at it, TREL 5075 underscore 100. This is a letter to Dr. Han, Great Ormond Street, July 1978. Um, and and it, it, again, the, the first paragraph is concerned with the individual patient. But if we pick it up in the second paragraph, he says, in our experience, prophylaxis is much more effective given on alternate days than twice weekly. Uh, if he's now under your care and you wish him to continue with prophylaxis while with us, we will need to resolve the frequency. I'd be grateful if you could let me have your views on this. So written confirmation there of what we heard orally um, uh, as was the experience of some of the pupils um, that, that when they were on courses of prophylaxis it tended to be on an alternate day uh, basis um, the, the, the then just I think a couple of letters which indicate that, that the use of factor concentrates on a prophylactic basis continued into 1983 and 1984. So we've been looking at documents largely from um, the 70s uh, and 1980. Uh, but if we look at TREL 40343 underscore 044, So th this is a letter from Dr. Aronstam, the 19th of March, 1984. Um, it's concerning a child. We can tell that it's addressed to a consultant pediatrician. Um, uh, um, and it, uh, um, it, it's a relatively um, young child. I can it, it indicate that much. Um, and then there's a discussion um, uh, in the last paragraph Sorry, in the second paragraph, first of all, there's a discussion about prophylaxis, where Dr. Owenson says, I'm sure that the correct approach is a course of effective prophylaxis. Um, um, and there, I think the only guidelines to the correct regime are to titrate the results against the dose. If there's breakthrough bleeding, then it's necessary to increase the dose and or the frequency of infusion. Um, on his present regime, it appears that the major problems occur on Sundays. And certainly in my own experience, I have found an alternate day regime preferable to a fixed three times weekly schedule. So there is a view expressed in March 1984 about um, using prophylaxis for this child. Um, and it's just a note that that's set against what we see in the last paragraph of the letter. I note your comment about factor eight preparations affecting T cells. This is a very worrying problem for all of us in haemophilia care. At present, the general view is that while the disease is horrific, the numerical risk of it is nevertheless very small and should not deflect us from the appropriate treatment. Naturally, we are all reviewing the situation constantly. Now, the reference to the disease that is horrific must, I think, be a reference to AIDS. It's the only inference that make, makes sense. But this might tend to suggest that Dr. Aronston's approach to the use of prophylaxis is not changed at all, at least as at March 1984, by what else was happening in, in, in terms of the knowledge of risk of AIDS. Um, and then if we just move to the end of 1984, TREL 40247 underscore 007, This is a letter to Dr. French uh, at the uh, Haemophilia Centre in Nottingham, 14th of December 1984, again about a different patient. Um, and we can see if we look at the third paragraph reference there to the, um, the prophylactic program, it says having, um, so, do, sorry, I'm sorry, can I pick it up in the previous paragraph, my, my fault. He has been on prophylaxis for almost the whole length of this term. So this is the autumn term of 1984, it must be, because the letter's being written in mid-December 84. 
having broken through the 20% raised alternate day prophylactic barrier, he likewise did with the 30% alternate day, and consequently we started him on 15% raised daily in an attempt to decrease the frequency of bleeds into his elbow. His daily prophylaxis was stopped on the 19th of November 1984 because of the changeover to heat-treated factor 8. Uh, in the following week, he bled four times into his elbow before his 20% heat-treated factor 8 prophylaxis was resumed on the 27th of November 1984. So we, we can, I think, in, infer from that that this programme of prophylaxis um, for almost the whole term in the autumn of 1984 um, continued until what we've seen there is the date of 19th of November on unheated concentrates. And then there was a switch to, at the end of November, prophylaxis was resumed, this time using heat-treated factor eight. So the same approach, again, appearing to be taken to the use of prophylaxis at the very tail end of 1984 with everything that was otherwise known um, at that point in time. Um, and then the last document on the issue of prophylaxis is at TREL, 5092 underscore 132. This takes us into July 1987. Um, we can see from the second main paragraph that there is a, still a 20% a alternate day prophylaxis program um, uh, being undertaken in 1987. Again, this is in relation to, to, to a different patient again. Um, but we can then see what Dr. Aronston says, oh, sorry, it's Dr. Wasserf says in the second, in the next paragraph, he's done very well in the past two months while on prophylaxis. The decision to terminate his prophylaxis was taken after careful consideration because of the recent increase in the number of published papers about the immunosuppressive effects of factor VIII concentrate, particularly in anti-HIV positive haemophiliacs. Um, and then he goes on to talk about having um, um, stopped the prophylaxis um, and, and giving the patient a rest. So we can see there the termination of a prophylactic program there because of what's said to be the risks of factor VIII concentrate, but there's no indication at any earlier stage in the documents we've seen of prophylaxis coming to an end because of um, the potential risks involved. Um, so the, the last topic I'm going to cover today um, it just looks at the involvement of Trelaw's clinicians in UK HCDO. And I'm going to do that to lay the groundwork then for an exploration of what the documents show us about knowledge of risk on the part of Trelaw's clinicians in relation to hepatitis and HIV, which I'll, I'll come on to tomorrow afternoon. But we, we can just see from a number of documents that clinicians at Trelaw's really were very closely involved with uh, UK HCDO and UK HCDO meetings. Dr. Rainsford attended the 1968 Haemophilia Centre Directors Meeting. If we just look briefly at HCDO 0001013. Um, we can see there, it's the minutes of the meeting of Haemophilia Centre Directors held at the Oxford Haemophilia Centre, 1st of October, 1968. And if we look down the list of attendees, which helpfully is in alphabetical order, towards the bottom, we can see Dr. S.G. Rainsford, Lord Mayor Trelaw College. I'm not going to go into the detail of what was discussed at each and every one of these meetings, but Dr. Rainsford was thereafter a, a fairly regular attendee. Dr. Aronstam was a regular attendee from... Um, April 1971, and again, if we just look briefly at that, HCDO 301014. We can see this is the meeting of the 5th of April 1971, and if we go down the page to, in the list of attendees, we can see um, Dr. Rainsford is there, at, identified as attending, and Dr. Aronston, um, they're recorded as representing, at that point, Alton General Hospital. Um, in, in terms of attendance, I'm, I'm not going to go to the documents, but I'm just going to give a list of the meetings and who attended when in the course of the 1970s and early 80s. Um, so on the 27th of October 1972 meeting was attended by Dr. R. Blaster, Dr. Aronstam and Dr. Rainsford. 
The November 74 meeting was attended by Dr. Rainsford and Dr. Arblaster. The September 75 meeting was attended by Dr. Aronstam and Dr. Rainsford. And although Dr. Kirk is not listed in the list of attendees, it's clear from the minutes of the meeting that Dr. Kirk was there too. Sorry, I've, skipped, I've missed 1974. That was the joint meeting with blood transfusion directors um, in January 74. Dr. Aronstam and Dr. Rainsford both in attendance. There are some meetings for which we don't have a list of attendees, so I, I can't, we can't tell who was there. But if we then go to January 77, Dr. Rainsford and Dr. Kirk were both in attendance. October 77, Aronstam, Kirk, Rainsford and Painter, so four representatives from Trelaws in attendance. And November 78, it's just Dr. Aronstam. November 79, it's Dr. Aronstam. Um, and then um, uh, uh, it, it, when we move on into the early 80s, Dr. Aronstam was present September 82, October 83, September 84, October 85. So he was a regular attender of haemophilia centre directors meetings he was then a member of the AIDS group of the UK HCDA which met from January 1985 onwards um, but it wasn't simply a question of attendance at the general annual meetings of haemophilia centre directors uh, if we look at LOTH 5012 underscore 122 This is a meeting of the reference centre directors on the 14th of September 1981. And if we go to page six, we can see bottom half of the page, there is a heading designation of the Trelaw Haemophilia Centre. The question of designation of Trelaw Haemophilia Centre as a reference centre was raised by Dr Savage. He drew attention to the fact that the centre had very special and wide experience in the management of haemophilia in adolescence and played an important role in introducing the boys who attended the college to home therapy. It was pointed out in discussion that Trelaw Haemophilia Centre was not in the same situation as the haemophilia reference centres, who had patients refer to them from wide areas and who provided a comprehensive service all the year round. The Trelaw Haemophilia Centre was closed down during the college holidays and patients had to go to Basingstoke for treatment. Professor Bloom thought that there might be serious problems if Trelaw was designated as a reference center. And he wondered whether perhaps it would be better for Dr. Aronstam to be invited to attend the haemophilia reference center directors meetings without the official designation of Trelaw as a reference center. Dr. Jones suggested that Dr. Aronstam should be co-opted to attend the haemophilia reference center directors meeting as the expert in adolescent haemophilia management in the same way as Dr. Krusk was invited to attend the meeting as the expert in hepatitis. It was agreed Trelaw Haemophilia Centre could not be designated as a reference centre, but that Dr. Aronstam should be invited to attend the meeting of reference centre directors on account of his special experience of managing haemophilic boys at the college. And that is what then happened. So the reference centre director meetings after 1981 were attended by Dr. Aronstam. He was there at the 1st of March 82 meeting, the 6th of September 82 meeting, the 14th of February 83 meeting, that was one of the very significant meetings in terms of discussions about AIDS, the 19th of September 83 meeting, the 13th of February 84 meeting, uh, and the meeting on the 10th of September 84, and, and then 18th of February 85. So he was not in attendance at the May 1983 special meeting of haemophilia reference centre directors. But otherwise, he was effectively privy to all the information that was being discussed at reference centre directors meeting, including, of course, the various updates provided by Dr. Krask, that a particular relevance when we look at knowledge of risk of HIV and AIDS. In addition, as, as again, we'll look at probably on Friday when I look at the question of research, Dr. Kirk was a member for a period of time of the hepatitis working party in the 70s. And so he too would have had access to some of the particular reports uh, being uh, produced by the hepatitis working party and, and by Dr. Krask on the issue of hepatitis. <coughs> um, so that the next topic I'm going to address orally is a rather large and significant topic, knowledge of risk of hepatitis and, and, and HIV. 
I don't think there's much to be gained from starting it at nearly quarter to five in the afternoon um, after a, a long day. So I'm going to suggest that I can pick that up tomorrow afternoon after we've heard the evidence of the headmaster, Mr McPherson, in the morning. Yes, so uh, Mr McPherson tomorrow morning uh, at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you, sir.